Hello, everybody. Um, as you heard, my name is Mario. Um, I'm coming from Intercom. We obviously sponsored this conference. Uh, I'm a guy who writes some code there, and uh, that's the official title of my position. How does this one work? Cool. So I'm here to tell you the story uh, of what actually happened when a bigger boat stopped being an option for us, or in other words, what happened to us when MySQL on the biggest box on Amazon stopped being an option. It was just too slow. Actually, it happened twice. So just to set some context and to know like, what you're working on, uh, what is Intercom? Intercom is a product company. That's something that defines the culture there very much. Uh, we are creating software, or uh, to phrase it a little bit better, we are creating a really cool software that simplifies communication between your business and your customers. So we're making it like very personal, we are making it more fun, and generally, we have the best business messenger in the world. It's not a secret. RDS, uh, RDS is actually very unpersonal service. It's AWS service, relational database service that actually runs the database for you. Aurora, it's their newest product uh, in the line. It's fork of MySQL or something similar, I'm not completely sure, uh, which seems to be very promising. And who the hell I am, right? Uh, so I'm not a DBA. This is a database talk. But I'm actually not good at databases. And we don't actually even have database administrators. So why? One of our core principles is to run less software. If we can get somebody who is world class to run our database, sure, we'll pay that guy. And the reason why, we actually truly believe that we can spend our time better than running databases. We don't want to handle all the shit that can happen there. So this is how our product actually works. It just like simplifies everything. But how it started? When Intercom was small, something really, really weird happened to us. It doesn't happen to many companies. People started using our product. And even a little bit more weird is they actually started giving us money for that. So as we wanted them to talk more and to give us more money, we developed different channels of communication. So now you actually have email communication. You can have a communication with your customers through your website. You can put the chat in your mobile app, uh, on your Facebook page, Twitter, wherever you want. Wherever you want. And here comes the nice part. We are not Snapchat. We have to store all these conversations, not for a short period of time. We have to store them forever. So if you started building your app the same time we did, you would probably have chosen the same set of technologies. Rails for backend, whatever JS for frontend, it changes all the time, right? And then for, back, for uh, database layer, it would probably be MySQL or Postgres, unless you really felt like hipster or if you fell into that NoSQL trap. So everything was really, really sim simple at start. We had one Rails app, one database, no microservices. And then what happened? We got customers. Our database was really, really slow. So. What do you think? What we did? Did we do any microservices? No. We got a bigger box. We got a bigger database that was just faster. That's it. And we were really good. We actually got more customers, more customers that were actually paying us money. So our database was on fire again. And the solution is pretty obvious. We all actually got the bigger database again. That's how it works. And then, at some point, after six months, database started being slow again. And you could ask yourself, where is the end of the story, right? So I'll tell you when. When all your customers leave your site, 
that's when you will start, when you will stop having scaling business, and like scaling, scaling problems. So you probably don't want that to happen. So we were on the bigger box, on the biggest box on Amazon, and we had problems. So on average, database would be just fine. But average is actually nothing. That's a really shitty metric. P95 and P99 metrics, they were going over the roof. So we did some analysis, and one table was actually far more shitty than others. That was one table where we store all these conversations. So what we did, we actually did the simplest thing possible. We said, OK, we don't have any joins between these tables, or we forbidden joins between these tables. And we just isolated that one table into a new database. So at the end, we actually had one database for conversations and one database for the rest of the data. And the problem here is that all these boxes were actually the biggest boxes on Amazon. And you know what's the story here, right? That it's getting slower. We had just one table on the database. And we had no unindexed queries. And it started getting slow again. So we analyzed the table. And guess what? We run this one query. It was actually quite fast. We got this number. So I'm not sure how many of you actually work with tables that have more than 2 billion rows. Is that less than 10? Yeah, I'd say this. So, OK, so you could say, like, what is the problem, right? As it grows, it's just going to get a little bit slower. But I'll tell you what's the problem. Your table actually can't fit in RAM. Because of that, eventually you have to read from disk, which means that like, disk is far slower than RAM. Your performance is going to be far less predictable, which means it's just shitty performance. And the bigger problem of the whole story is that you have a fixed schema. And I'm not thinking about structured schema that you get, that you get with MySQL. I'm thinking about fixed schema the situation where you can't change your table schema at all. So usually, when you start working, you just use alter table statements. And that's something that Rails migrations use by default. After some time, we got big enough that database would be really, really slow during that. It would block. App would go down. That was fine with me. But customers would complain. Board wasn't happy with that. So that wasn't an option. We had to find something else. And usually, when people start handling the load of that size, they use Percona Toolkit, which is like trigger-based migrations, which is like really, really bad, or something similar. And that was working quite fine with us. But if you can understand, actually, the schema here, the problem is that during that migration, your database load doubles. And it was working for us quite fine for some time. Eventually, we just got out of capacity, actually, and everything would be done. So that is actually the time when I joined the Intercom. So all the stories I told you so far, that could be a lie. We wouldn't know that. OK. So when you join Intercom, it's very usual to actually go on a tour. You go to different teams to figure out how different teams work and what team is good for you and what's not. My intermission was actually to try to move that massive database where we stored all the conversations to something better. So what options did we have? Our first option was DynamoDB. And since we would have to do like a massive overhaul of everything, we didn't even actually research that option. The second one was partition MySQL, which is doable. But if you remember one thing that we do not want to run a database, RDS was actually running a version that's not supporting partitioning. Also, partitioning doesn't co come without, without trade-offs. So we actually started looking into Aurora.
So, yeah, that's wrong. Uh, so the best property of Aurora for us was actually the fact that we don't have to run that. Somebody else would do that for us, and that somebody is AWS, and that somebody is really good at it. It's also VPC service, not VPS, which means that you can keep all the data in your virtual private cloud, and if you are handling many customers' data like we do, you probably don't want the data to leave your cloud. And one thing that's really, really interesting is that database is actually 100% MySQL 5.6 compliant. And that was actually the version that we were running at production. We are lazy to write code. Like, we like it, but we don't do that if we don't have to. We are lazy to run two databases at the same time. We don't want to lose any customer data. And the fact that we could change one database to another just with changing DNS names, that was really, really, really good to us. So we started looking into that, and they were advertising stuff like this. Like MySQL compatible, OK, that's cool. Fast, highly scalable, avail available, and durable. So I guess, is there any database except MySQL compatible that's not advertising that? Yeah, I don't think so. Then they had ads like this one, like 10 times faster than our MySQL environment. It just works. I didn't know if that's going to work for us, too. Yeah, so I wanted to test that. Um, when I started like, researching Aurora, I actually found that Amazon published some papers on benchmarking performance. So I wanted to do two types of testing. One is synthetic testing, which would actually get some artificial database, get some benchmar benchmarking tool, and it would send some artificial queries against that artificial database. And the reason why I wanted to do that is I actually wanted to verify that I can replicate the results they are advertising. If I can't do that, I don't know like, if my tools are correct, if my processes are correct, nothing. So I needed some point of reference, actually. And I wasn't worried about that at all. And the reason why is I knew I'm not the first guy doing that. Some people are actually uh, living from that. And I was pretty sure that I would be able to find some tools. Production-like testing. Mm. That one actually was a problem. Uh, it was a testing where, ideally, you would get the clone of your production database. And then uh, you would somehow record real queries and try to replay them, distributed, in correct order. And I was just struggling finding tools for that. So I thought, maybe if I go just with synthetic testing, Maybe I would get a, an answer to my question. Is that a good database for us? So I started. Uh, I read the papers. They used Sysbench. Uh, I was really proud of myself. Uh, later on, I figured out that's a quite a standard tool, actually, for testing databases. Uh, so how it works? Uh, I got some boxes, I started shooting queries with that, and uh, actually everything was fine, but I had to tweak some kernel limits to make sure that all CPU cores are processing network packets, and because of that, and some race conditions in Sysbench, it wouldn't stop. So the solution is you download the source code and fix that. But while I was doing that, I actually figured out that the real benchmarking is done in Lua scripts. So Sysbench is written in C, but all the queries that you are going to shoot the database are written in Lua. So in Intercom, we have a small tool that for each query that's ever run in production records how many times it's run and where from. So I actually, for top three queries of each type, I created like the ratios that what they represent the production load. And with that and playing with random random number generators, I created an image of production load. 
And that was actually enough for us to make sure that we can test it, because I was originally thinking that I need exactly the same load. But if you think about that, your production load is changing every day. It's not a static thing. So it doesn't matter, even if I test something, and even if, if it's 100% the same, that's not telling me a lot. Or it could change tomorrow, it's telling me a lot, but it's, it's, it's changing every day. So I had actually eight biggest boxes, like R3 at Excel, sending queries to Aurora, and I got the results. And to be honest, it was quite impressive. The single box of Aurora was able to serve 80k reads and 20k writes. Oh yeah, that's wrong also. No tears. So that's actually not the upper bound of Aurora. Uh, they are advertising that it can serve up to 120k reads, but it was enough for us to know that we can actually move, that we can roll forward. So here we go. We decided not to go with DynamoDB, which was a good move. Uh, we decided to actually move to something that's exactly, or like very, very similar with what we had before. So I created a plan like this. Uh, you have MySQL production, and this is the box you want to get rid of. You have Aurora, and you establish binary replication between two of them. And then, just to make sure that you can actually roll back on MySQL, you create the second MySQL box and establish replication bet between these two. This one is not working by default, so you have to not hack, but you have to play a little bit with security groups to make, it, to make sure that it works, actually. This, was our, this is the part of our, of our rollout plan. Uh, we had, like I think, 72 steps of that. We did it twice, and it worked perfectly, actually. So we migrated database within eight minutes of downtime, which was actually pretty good, because we didn't even break SLAs that week. And when I'm trying to sell this story to anybody, I ask myself if we did something really cool here. And answer is no. We actually did the very boring stuff. And it's a classic thing, move one database to another. But then, if I ask myself, have we actually solved our problem? Have we increased availability? Can we help the business to grow? Hell yeah. So sometimes, when your boat is too small, just buy a ship. It's completely fine. So where, where are we now? When we were running that old MySQL cluster, we had a guy, his name was Danny. He was maintaining all these parameters for MySQL. He knew how it works. Uh, he was very useful. When he would go off, we would be in problems. Uh, we don't need Danny anymore with Aurora. And uh, Danny is still with us, so no harm. Uh, then he's just doing uh, something that he actually prefers, and that's coding. Uh, so that's, that's one benefit. The other one is uptime is just great. That database is so more powerful that we just have no problems. Since it is more powerful, we actually like, have far more headroom, so performance is quite predictable. Uh, the original problem that we had of schema changes, we haven't solved it completely. So we can change the table schema now, but our migrations actually take 10 days to finish. We usually ship features in a week or two, and it's quite a problem, actually, because whatever you want to do, you have to plan everything 10 days in advance. And fast failovers. So when we had that old MySQL cluster, the problem was that if the primary would fail over, we would, have, we would need a guy who would be woken up in the middle of the night to restart the app so the drivers could actually pick up the change and so the whole cluster could actually elect a new primary. That's not happening anymore. When primary fails over, it takes around two to three minutes 
to connect to a new primary, and that's vastly spent because of DNS uh, cache. And read replicas. So Aurora is actually using replication on the storage layer. It's not using binary log, which is really good for us. Replication lag is very, like, I've never seen replication lag going about 30 milliseconds, which means that we can actually use any secondary for as a read node. That was not the case before. When we were running MySQL, our replication lag during a peak time would be hour and a half. So it's a small improvement, hour and a half to 30 milliseconds. So what I've learned, when a bigger boat is not an option, it's totally fine to buy a ship. It doesn't have to be an expensive one. It doesn't have to be a rocket ship. Test what you need, and if it suits you, just go there. And the second thing is something that was very, very valuable for me as a young engineer. Boring technologies are usually proven. It's completely fine to not run Kafka. It's completely fine to not be on Docker. It's completely fine to not run in Cassandra or whatever it's called today. Like important business problems do not always have to be solved with complex solutions. Sometimes it's very simple. Sometimes it's okay to buy a better boat. That's all for me.